My amplified unit, Saloon. BC absolutely stunned as in 24 hours, WWE will allow one of its top prospects to walk right into free agency as the company has chose not to renew the contract of Dijak or offer him any type of new deal. This is a dude that many of us perceived should have already been a superstar in that company, but instead was dicked around left and right. Does T-Bar ring a bell? This is a dude that says not long ago he was told by a high-end executive that he was crushing it. He was under the impression the entire time that not only was he being re-signed, but they actually had creative for him. They were going to utilize him to his talent and skill level finally. And instead, at the 11th hour, they turned their backs on him. Oh, we're going to talk about it. Absolutely stunned the company did not see the value that was sitting in their lap with DiJack. We'll talk about it. We're also going to discuss a big conversation, a big discussion in the pro wrestling world right now. AEW boss Tony Khan claiming that that his company, AEW, has the best women's wrestling in all the world. Now, on one hand, what is he supposed to say? It's his company. Of course, he's going to put his division, his females, his wrestlers on a pedestal. So on one hand, what is he supposed to say? On the other hand, is it true, right? Because it is the AEW boss saying this, it will spark the conversation. And then you have to have that real talk. Well, who does have the best women's wrestling in the world? Is it New Japan? Is it WWE? Maybe it's NXT. Is it AEW? We'll talk about it in this upload. So a lot to get to. But time out, before we get into any of these stories, a huge congratulations to WWE superstar Rhea Ripley and AEW pro wrestler Buddy Matthews, announcing recently they have indeed gotten married. Rhea Ripley, Buddy Matthews are now married. So Rhea Ripley is doing a lot during her rehab time. We wish them the best. If you're ever wondering, can WWE and AEW coexist? There you go. Or at least they're going to try to coexist, right? They're going to give this a real attaboy, a real college try, this marriage thing. (laughs) AEW, WWE, the wrestlers have been coexisting for a while. Andrade was with AEW when he was still with Charlotte Flair, still is. But she was WWE, he was AEW. Zelina Vega was WWE. Malachi is AEW. And of course, Buddy, Rhea, and there's several others as well. So uh, they can coexist. How long? That's another story, but we wish them the best. Rhea Ripley, Buddy Matthews, pretty cool. Also, I do have to mention we do have NXT's rating from this week. And NXT lost well over 100,000 viewers. uh, Down from 700 semi-odd to 611,000 viewers this week. And if you caught JR9's review of NXT, that was in my last upload Uh, Down in the comments, JR9 said he felt it was an even worse episode than last week somehow. And JR9 nailed it because most viewers felt the same way. There's no excuse. It doesn't matter what sporting event or, or what was up against it or if there was a concert or there was nice weather. It doesn't matter. You lost over 100,000 viewers. You only had 700,000 to begin with. You can't be losing that much. You cannot be pulling in 611. So you don't need BC to tell you that's not a good number. And as JR9 said in his review of NXT, we're starting to go that WWE Paul Levesque McMahon route where you're starting to get heel versus heel matches and face versus face. And that just doesn't make sense. Nor is it as fun as it can be. Like Lola versus Roxy, I'm okay with that if if you're doing it correctly. Roxy is a straight up heel and she's doing that phenomenally, by the way. But Lola has been built up to be the heel. It's easy to boo Lola, right? So now you're having Lola versus Roxy. Anyway, it's just, you know, there's all these little things. And, and then every time I wasn't able to catch the whole show in its entirety live, but I was able to check back every now and again. And unfortunately, every time I would check back, it was just a rough part of the show, like exceptionally rough, like Sol Ruka, who I'm high on, like botching her soul snatcher. 
And it was a it was a bad botch. Like it affected the whole finish. They had to reset. It looked so awkward. It looked pretty foolish. And then Coffee, Joe Coffee was was botching as well a couple of times in his match. And unfortunately, I caught that. And then there was this weird backstage brawl. I believe it was with Jada Parker. I couldn't tell you because the camera was shaking so much to try to make us believe the brawl is so mega, right? It's such a chaotic brawl that the camera is shaking left, right, up, down. The problem was it was too much. You couldn't even see what was happening. It was so distorted. It was so close. It was moving too fast. It was more nauseating than cool. You didn't feel you were watching a cool, chaotic brawl. You were actually getting nauseous from the camera moving so fast. The distorted imaging, it it was, it was absolutely, it was bad. They can never do that type of camera work again. I know what they were going for, right? The illusion that the, the brawl is so chaotic. We've seen that before, but if you don't know how to do it right, if your if your imaging starts to be so distorted <laughs> and you're still shaking left, right, up, down, you don't even realize it, don't do the shot. It's done. Because your audience is literally just getting sick at that point. Anyway, there was uh, the little parts I was able to catch with NXT. It was absolutely rough. It was a really rough watch. And, and JR9, <laughs> you guys caught that re- report, the NXT report for this week from JR9 Gaming. Man, uh, there was even more that I didn't see that was just not on par. So 611,000 viewers for NXT. Not good. Can they rebound? The answer is yes. Will they? That's up to Shawn Michaels and the boys and gals. All right, let's get into... um, I want to start right with the DiJack conversation. This is absolutely wild to to BC and many of you guys. And I want to set the stage right off the bat... To get this out of the way, this isn't one of those like overreactions to like a mid Carter losing their job or getting released or WWE just choosing not to resign. And all of a sudden the, you know, the wrestling community just overreacts and we're all like, what? How can you do that? Drew Gulak is amazing. You know, and it's like Drew Gulak, there was a ceiling. All right. (laughs) Drew Drew Gulak wasn't going to be the Hulk Hogan or the Steve Austin or anything like that. I'm just using him as an example. But yes, there's times we overreact all the time. And then there's times we're literally baffled that they can let a dude or gal walk. Somebody like a Mercedes, Sasha Banks, somebody like Cameron Grimes. That wasn't an overreaction. Cameron Grimes is a dude that could rock the mic. He's really good in the ring. And we already know what he did in NXT. He can put storylines on his back. How do you let somebody like Cameron Grimes not only walk, but you never gave him a chance? You never even gave the dude a chance. And one of the reasons he was released, he feels, is because he gave creative ideas. He was trying to pitch ideas because they were never coming to him with anything. So he's like, if you're paying me to stay at home or sit at catering to take all the triple layered moose cake, I kind of want to be doing something. So I have some ideas. They didn't want to hear it. They released the dude. Found he was getting too annoying because he had too many ideas. Sound familiar? Vincent Kennedy, Paul Levesque McMahon, doesn't matter. If it's not from them, they don't want to hear it. And I bring up Cameron Grimes specifically because DiJack says he told the company the same thing, went to them with ideas, thoughts, creative input, anything that he thought was going to help the company because they surely were not going to him with thoughts, ideas, and creative input. And he didn't want to impede on everything else they were doing. So he said, well, if we do this or that, it doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of effort. Just give me a little bit of the platform. I'll do all the work. But he told that company time and time again, I don't want to be at catering eating all the triple layered moose cake. Give that to everybody else. But the company just didn't see him as, as a viable key to the roster. And DiJack was like, I know I can be a huge asset to the roster. But for anybody that thinks that, that it's an overreaction to DiJack leaving the company, it's not at all. This He's the real deal. He's got so much talent. He can rock a promo, and we know he can carry storylines. I, I mean, do you guys remember the matches he had with Keith Lee? That match with Keith Lee at TakeOver a few years ago. That was wild. What about recent? more recently? The match with Dragunov. Was that like Last Man Standing? Every time I see DiJack, it's it's a remote control right down. It doesn't matter what else was on your last button channel, right? Last channel button. It doesn't matter. DiJack just he makes you just put the remote down. 
That's just how good he is. And the thing that the thing that's just mind-boggling is they didn't scratch the surface with the dude. It's just like Cameron Grimes and so many others, right? That we never even got to see just even a piece of what this dude can do on the main roster. T-Bar is the best they had for him. T-Bar. I mean, they were setting this dude up to fail from the beginning. There was a disconnect. It's like sometimes this company will see somebody and they just know that's somebody who can just take off. That's somebody who can literally be on top of the company. And it's almost like it scares them. It's almost like they don't want it. It's like retracted at that point. Like they they have to do everything to make sure that doesn't happen. Dijak. They're going to let this dude walk. They're not going to renew the contract. They're not going to offer a new deal. Dijak of all people. And he says in his statement, he says he was under the impression that, <laughs> that he was going to be resigned, had discussions at first, and then he's like, then they just stonewalled him. All of a sudden, he heard nothing. But just recently being told he was crushing it by a top-level executive. And then at the 11th hour was the word that he used. Uh, they decided, he was told that uh, they're not going to renew. And when I say 11th hour, I mean tomorrow his contract ends. Dijak is done in WWE. And again, it sucks because we never got to see the dude on the main roster actually rock it, man. The Dijak Gunther matches, Cody Rhodes and Dijak. These are the matches. Randy Orton and Dijak. Are you kidding me? Like, like if you're a pure real wrestling fan and you know Dijak's work, you know Dijak... Uh, what he's capable of, you've seen his his matchups, you know what he does on the mic, w- what he can contribute storyline-wise. If you actually know Dijak's body of work, and you think of these wrestlers on that main roster, y- how can you not be excited? And instead, it's just like, <laughs> just kidding, he just got, he just got drafted to Monday Night Raw, and he was told to sit at catering until your release. Not what he was told, of course. He was told he's crushing it. That's a quote. You're crushing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll work on your deal soon. And then they're like, psych. JK. Just kidding. We're actually going to release you. Another dude that, that admits he had ideas. He had all these thoughts. WWE wasn't giving him anything. They were having him sit home or in catering. Those are facts, right? It's, it's kind of a case of somebody that just cared perhaps too much about his placement in the company, his character, his body of work as a whole in totality, and he thought he was helping out by going to the company, going to the suits and ties with thoughts, ideas, and creative input because he knew they were not working on anything for him, and he was right. But he found out the hard way that that company looks at that as a detriment. People that have their own thoughts, own ideas, own creative input, they don't need anybody to hold their hand. The company doesn't like that. You sit at that table, you eat all the triple aired moose cake until they tell you to put the plate down and get up from the table. Until they tell you to do that, you do exactly as they say, exactly how they do it. So Dijak's time in WWE was pretty much doomed from the jump, just like Cameron Grimes and so many before them. But for fans that are are, are befuddled that there's so many fans that are stunned that Dijak and WWE are parting ways, that WWE doesn't see the value in Dijak and are just going to let this dude walk. The the fans that think we're taking it too far, it's just Dijak. He's not that important to WWE. Well, maybe that's the problem. Maybe there's some truth in that. The, The fact that not enough fans see that there's something really wrong with letting somebody like Dijak walk. The talent that this guy truly has and the fact that he at least, at the bare minimum, deserved a chance on the main roster. All of those epic matches you could have had in feuds and storylines that Dijak would have helped propel. And instead, we get none of them. They just waited until his contract ran up and that's how they chose to boot him from the company. So we're not releasing you. Your contract is so close. We're just going to have you sit at that table, keep pumping those triple aired moose cakes out. And when the 28th of June comes up, sayonara, check you. But maybe that's the problem, you, you know, with, with those that think it's over-exaggerated that fans are stunned that Dijak is no longer a part of WWE. Maybe that's, that's the problem. Not enough fans are actually stunned <laughs> because Dijak is that good. And he deserved a chance way more than than T-Bar. 
dude was absolutely done dirty and i absolutely believe it when he says like he was told he was crushing it he was he was told that he's doing good over back in nxt i mean he was brought back to nxt and he did everything he was told and he rocked it out he was crushing it is what he was told was under the belief that there was going to be that renewal and then all of a sudden they turned their backs on him out of nowhere stonewalled him was the word that he used just stopped talking to him and then he was informed (laughs) <laughs> literally informed just days before his contract ends by the way we're not going to renew you that's that's literally doing dirty to a dude that not only did everything you told him to do but tried to help you by doing your own job by coming to you with ideas and thoughts of how to use him or what to do with him or just use him absolutely done dirty uh, I, I i'm still i still can't fathom how they lost cameron grimes uh, can you tell uh, it's a name i brought up many times i still am trying to fathom that and it's been a few months now you add in die jack and, and i just don't understand how paul Levesque mcmahon looks at a cameron grimes and a die jack and goes eh, i got other business to attend to I understand you have a bloated roster aew has an even more bloated roster wwe though they're they're not They're not safe from that conversation. They absolutely have a bloated roster. You have to trim the fat where you can. Dijak isn't that fat. You trim the roster, yeah, there's a bunch of names I can give you that easily could be out of the company and nobody would bat an eyelash. Nobody would think twice to go, what, they're gone? Dijak is just not one of them. But somehow, he became one of them. Dijak no longer with WWE as of tomorrow, the 28th of June. His contract runs out. WWE has chose to boot him at that point. I, I, again, haven't even fathomed the Cameron Grimes thing. I, don't, I think it'll be a long time before I will even attempt to fathom how you lose Dijak, a talent like that. And finally, Tony Khan recently opening up Pandora's box with an interview with, I believe it was Sports Illustrated, 85, 90% sure it was Sports Illustrated. Tony Khan says, and I quote, in talking about his women's division, Tony Khan said, I feel we have the best women's wrestling in all the world, end quote. And of course, this sparked immense conversation in the wrestling community. Eye of the beholder, it's subjective, no doubt. But if we really thought about it, if you looked at all three companies, let's just put NXT with the WWE main roster for the sake of a a, a company in totality. WWE, TNA, AEW. If you really think about who has the best women's wrestling, I think factually we could come up with a gold medalist, right? If it was like the Olympics, you have the gold, the silver, and the bronze. (laughs) I think we could, if we're talking in facts, Come up with one out of the three companies that has the best women's wrestling. Now, which would that be? That would take a lot of deep diving, right? It would take a lot of just thinking about who is on each roster because each roster has so many good talents. TNA has always had a a great women's roster. The knockouts division has always kind of propelled TNA as a whole. And I'm talking about through the years, whether it was Gail Kim, Mickey James, or Deanna Barrazzo, or uh, uh, Jordan Grace. They've always had such an immaculate women's roster. AEW is no pushover. I mean, they have, they still have Soraya and Tony Storm, who I feel is putting on some of the best work of her career, by the way, Tony Storm. Mercedes Monet, I still feel the best female wrestler on the planet. Britt Baker. You may not think, you know, move for move, or you, you may not want to see her in a 60-woman Iron Man match, right? 60-minute Iron Man match. I get it, but Britt Brit Baker checks off so many boxes. Like, Britt Baker has a character, she has an aura, a presence, and she's fun. She can put storylines on her back. Uh, Britt Baker is somebody who you just don't skim over on a roster sheet. So AEW has a lot, and of course, WWE, that's pretty obvious, whether it's like up-and-comers like Tiffany Stratton, or somebody that's been there for a little bit, like a Bianca Belair, or who WWE puts on a pedestal, like a Charlie Flair. And in between, you got the Becky Lynches, and the EO Skies, and the Oscars. The list goes on and on. So, you know, if you have to have a gold, a silver, and a bronze medalist, you know, a lot of it up front is subjective. 
But if you took a real deep dive, I bet you we could factually see who has the best women's wrestling in the world. But for people getting upset with Tony Khan, you know, on one hand, it's like, what is he supposed to say, right? He's not going to say he has the second best women's wrestling in the world, right? He's going to propel his division. He's going to speak highly, the, the, the most highly of his people, his superstars, his wrestlers. Now, on the other hand, you could say he could have said nothing at all, BC. Why even open up Pandora's box? Why even open up the debate and the conversation? Because you could easily say that this company and that company would squash their division. So that's the answer, BC. Don't even talk like that. Don't even make such a bold statement that you have the best women's wrestling on the planet. I understand that philosophy as well. right? <laughs> Just don't say it at all. But he was trying to... He was trying to promote and market his females which is something we always ask these promoters to do they don't do it enough so he made the bold statement <laughs> we have the best women wrestling in the world it's just when you make that type of statement now you're the discussion will be there now you know and people are going to start going well wait is can tony storm beat jordan grace over in tna you know, can Soraya right now, Soraya in 2024, with all the injuries and all that, can she really take on Bianca Belair? Is Britt Baker going to defeat Charlie Flair? You know, can Abaddon really defeat Bailey? Can Jamie Hayter defeat somebody like EO Sky or Asuka? You know, you're going to open up that conversation. People are going to go, wait a second. That doesn't, add. if you take this roster and you put it side by side with this roster, how are you going to make that claim? But that would be interesting, right? If we really actually put the rosters together, uh, you could probably factually go, wait, that pales in comparison. Now, BC didn't do that for you, but maybe that's an interesting topic for another, another day for sure. But it's definitely a discussion for today because Tony Khan made it such. Best wrestling for the women in the world. I don't know. What do you guys think, man? Is, is he right? Is AEW the best? Does AEW have the best women wrestling, women's wrestling in the entire world? Or do you easily give that to a WWE? Or do you say none of them, WWE or AEW, TNA still does? Or do you say, no, you know what? None of them. It's Japan. <laughs> Japan always did. Japan still does. Maybe you're in that. Maybe you're in that thought press process, right? I mean, every time you see some of these year-end awards or whatever, you see so much Japanese talent, stardom talent. You know, it's, it's where they're taking the Asukas and the Eos and the Karis and the Julias for a reason. It's like NBA, right? The NBA, it's being slowly overtaken by a lot of, a lot of individuals from France. France! Who would have thought? Basketball's getting huge there. The players are getting so good. In the NBA, they that's who they want. So the draft is ongoing, and so many players came from France. I think in like the top six picks last night, three of them, at least half, was those first rounders were from France. You know, so so Japan has to be in that conversation, and some people would have Japan as the leader in women's wrestling. It's an interesting conversation. Tony Khan sparked it. Some people had fun with it. Other people were just like, what is this dude on? <laughs> anyway, thought that would be a fun discussion and a fun way to end the upload. Until next time. And there will be that next time. Top guys, my Amplified Unit and BC, we out. Check you.